Hi guys, welcome to week three. Today we're going to start talking about endosymbiosis, but we're going to be talking about endosymbiosis for probably the rest of the course. Your reading for this week is the Graham chapter seven that I put on Canvas. You can also take a look at chapter 12, Raven. There's a small section that discussed uh, endosymbiotic theory. So today I want you to understand the serial endosymbiotic theory and understand the difference between primary, secondary, and tertiary endosymbiosis. The third point, identifying extent taxa belonging to each type, that is something we're gonna work on throughout the whole semester, so I'm not that concerned that you get that nailed right now, and we're, I'm not really even gonna talk about names that much today. Except for this one, Vorticella, I'm gonna start with a name. Vorticella is a cute little heterotrophic protist. Um, what's in the water? And I said it was heterotrophic, but you can see it's clearly green. It's filled with many, many cells of a single celled uh, alga called chlorella. And if you slice open a vorticella cell, you'll see that these chlorella cells have been phagocytosed by the vorticella. Now, phagocytosis is the ability for organisms to envelop and engulf their prey um, and digest it. But here you can see that the prey has been Gulf, but it hasn't been digested. Um, the vorticella figured, well, I don't know if they figured it out, but they were more fit when they didn't digest the chlorella com compared to when they did digest them. So if you let the chlorella live, you get more carbon from their photosynthesis than that tiny little cell. And this relationship here where you've got organisms living within another organism, that's endosymbiosis and it is everywhere, right? All creatures. I think every creature, every multicellular creature and many, many single cell organisms have endosymbionts, right? This little squid has bacteria that can glow, that live in it. Isn't that adorable? Coral are full of endosymbionts. They have different kinds of protists and bacteria that live in them and do different things for them. Um, they produce carbon, they produce um, amino acids, they produce other metabolites for defense. Two worms. Two worms live in the bottom of the, um, well, these ones, in the Atlantic Ocean where there's no light. So they don't, these two worms don't associate with any photosynthetic bacteria. They do associate with chemosynthetic bacteria, these bacteria that can break down chemicals to produce energy. And the, this is the basis of the food, the entire basis of the food chain down there. Um, but pretty much everywhere you look, you're gonna see endosymbionts. You take a big organism, you stain it or you cut it up and you are going to see bacteria. And this is a plant root and you can see all the tiny little lights, fluorescent lights, those are bacterial cells or fungi. Even within the plant embryo, right? Here's a corn seed and inside is a little tiny baby corn plant. Bacteria are, are already in the embryo. Lichen though, is lichen endosymbiosis? Lichen is symbiosis, right? You've got cyanobacteria, algae, and fungi living together, but they're not intracellular. So there's, they're just living together in a big kind of hodgepodge of hyphae and cells. So this is not an endosymbiosis. This is just symbiosis living together. Um, but in algae, it's very, very common. You've got heterotrophs uh, take up some photosynthetic cells. Endosymbionts are not this. Now this is a ciliate. This is a predatory heterotrophic ciliate. And it is chalk a block of single celled photosynthetic uh, organisms, all sorts of organisms. There's just tons of them. But the cilia is eating them, right? This guy just bust a gut. He's gonna digest them all. And that's not endosymbiosis. That is just heterotrophy. Just engulfing them and digesting them. Same with euglena. Euglena has, sometimes it has chloroplasts, but it can also hunt. So it also eats photosynthetic organisms. So when we're talking about endosymbionts, in general, we're talking about intracellular. They can be obligate. They don't have to be obligate. Symbionts that are vertically or horizontally transmitted from parent cell to offspring cell. Um, vertically, if they're vertically transferred, it means that uh, the gametes actually produce them. If they're horizontally transmitted, that means that the embryo picks them up directly from the, or the zygote 
or the embryo picks them up directly from the environment. Okay. And some people think that these examples, right, of Vorticella that takes in endosymbionts represents evolution in real time because eventually what is two organisms might become one organism. And there's some evidence for that happening. Um, kleptoplastids, and this was something um, that was, Graham talked about a lot in your chapter. Kleptoplastids are those that occur when a chemotroph ingests an organism with a plastid and digests almost everything except for the plastid. It keeps just enough of that organism alive to keep the plastid alive as long as possible. Now, in this case, they have to keep eating organisms. So it's not like that predatory ciliate that was just stuffed full of, um, or stuffed full of cells and that was gonna digest. These guys eat organisms with plastids, but they keep them alive as long as they possibly can. Eventually they'll digest them, but they get a lot more mileage out of it. So they're kind of stealing the plastids, kleptoplastids. Um, the plastids that stay in the organism, right? This is a nudibranch, my favorite organisms, nudibranch, sea slugs. Um, they, uh, they try to keep them alive. And you can think, well, evolution might be working towards that somehow these sea slugs will figure out how to keep plastid alive without the other bits of machinery. Um, here's another nudibranch, so beautiful. This one has zooxanthellae in it, um, a protistin alga, red alga. So they're eating the red alga, but they take the plastids and they keep the plastids alive long enough. And uh, if, if you, so here's a good example from dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates are um, protists really cool protists. I'll talk about them a lot more later. And people think that they're in an intermediate stage of evolution because what they do is they take, so the round cells are the dinoflagellates, the cigar shaped cells are the diatoms. They take a diatom, here in, in B we've got three dinoflagellates, one diatom. In C you can see this one dinoflagellate has got a, a peduncle or like a pseudopodium and it's sucking out the cytoplasm from the diatom from its shell. And you can see down in D, it's coming out. It takes the plastids and some cytoplasm and even the nucleus, and it just leaves an almost empty shell of the diatom and swims away. And the plastids from that event last several weeks. Now, if you take a dinoflagellate and you prevent it, it from ever interacting with other diatoms, it will be able to photosynthesize for about three weeks before the plastids die and it can't photosynthesize anymore. But if you give it access to fresh diatom supplies, it will keep replenishing its stores. Okay, so there's endosymbionts, there's kleptoplastids. These are all kind of halfway to um, endosymbiotic theory, but they're not there all the way because endosymbiotic theory you're such an extreme obligate symbiont that you lose the ability to live outside of your host you only live in your host and doing so you give up all sorts of things you give up most of your organelles you give up most of your dna um who knows why this happens like you clearly the host is benefiting is the endosymbiont benefiting i mean it lost its dna so you might think no hard to say what the conditions were like back when it happened originally. It's called serial endosymbiotic theory because it didn't happen all at once. The ancestral host cells first of, um, developed mitochondria and then over time went on to, to develop plastids. Okay, so you can think of endosymbiotic theory as who ate whom, but it's not so simple, right? So the very most basic cartoony version is you've got this bagotrophic, heterotrophic eukaryote, right? With no cell wall, it's like an amoeba, it's oozing around, it comes across as free living photosynthetic bacteria or not, not a photosynthetic bacteria in the case of mitochondria, and it eats it. But the ones that don't fully get digested tend to have more benefits. And so over time, 
keeps it and it doesn't digest it. And over generations, back because of horizontal gene transfer, bacterial genes get transferred to the nuclear, um, the nucleus, and it becomes exchange of product and genes between the nuclear cell and the or, or the nucleus and the new cell. Eventually, this mitochondrion can't sustain it. It's not self-sustaining. It doesn't have enough um, biochemical machinery and it's completely dependent on the host cell. But my question for you is, who were the ancestors? Right? We have two organisms, not just one. We always talk about the organisms that gave rise to the chloroplast and the mitochondria. We know quite a lot about them. Who was the host? Who is this hypothetical host ancestor? That's a lot more murky. Um, what we do know is entirely from molecular data, I would say. And when you look at eukaryotes and you look at the deep, deep evolution of eukaryotes, there's two big classes of genes. One contains all the informational genes, like translation, transcription, replication of DNA. The other lineage, these are nuclear, nuclear genes, contains operational genes, right? Genes that help the cell divide, helps the cell function, um, involved in metabolism, involved in maintaining the organelles. So there's these two classes of genes. And what's really interesting is that there's evidence that these two genes are from different organisms. Operational genes may have come from bacteria, whereas the informational genes may have come from archaea. Right, and here's just two little trees showing that. So the idea is that informational genes, the host, the putative ancestral host may have been an archaea, whereas the plastid genes, um, the operational genes came from bacteria. So it's a hybrid. So these two domains came together and formed a new domain, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Um, yeah, so there's a chloroplast and a mitochondrion. Of course, all of this was heavily dependent on horizontal gene transfer, right? An endosymbiont can't become an organelle unless there's transfer of DNA between the host and the, the, the chloroplasts organism or the mitochondrial organism, right? They have to be able to share genes. If they can't, it can never become an organism. So this is why horizontal gene transfer is so, so critical to the evolution of eukaryotes. We talked about this on Friday, right? The three different ways that the DNA can move around between different organisms. And in this case, there's horizontal gene movement between the host and the symbiont, but then there's also transfer between hosts. So you can imagine how confusing this might become if different symbionts, symbiotic events exchange DNA with their hosts and those most hosts exchange DNA. Is it ever gonna be really possible to figure out who is the original? Well, surprising, it's surprising how much we do know, really, when you think of how messy you can get. Um, so let's talk about primary endosymbiosis. And the way I'm gonna talk about the rest of the class is we're gonna talk about Primary symbiosis, I'm gonna describe what the three types of symbiosis are, but then we're gonna talk about primary symbiosis and the organisms that have it today, and then secondary and then tertiary. So primary endosymbiosis is easiest. Um, and in this case, the ingested prokaryote, the prokaryote that's ingested, archaea or bacteria, um, becomes an endosymbiont. It's only one ingestion event and many extant species or taxa evolved from this one event. And here, this is from the Graham paper, right? And this is the, the primary endosymbiosis symbiosis hypothesis where there's a single primary event, right? This heterotroph isocyanobacteria, and that, that event gave rise to three different lineages, uh, green algae and land plants, red algae, and glycophytes. Like I said, don't worry too much about the names. We're gonna get into them. You'll know them all soon. But if you read closely the, the Graham paper, he said that's only one theory. The other theory is that there were multiple primary events and those primary events then gave rise to su um, subsequent uh, lineages. So there's paraphyletic, um, para the, the, 
these organisms are paraphyletic, not monophyletic. And in this scenario, there's evidence that there was one event for the glaucophytes and one event for the red algae and the green algae and land plants. So far, we can't resolve it. There's just two competing hypotheses. I hope you can still hear me, even though somebody is mowing their lawn at night. Who knows why? Actually, it's not just two events or one event. We know that Pollinella, which is another eukaryote, um, has a chloroplast that's different than all other organisms on the planet. And um, its ancestors ingested a prochlorococcus um, bacterium, and it's clearly different than everything else. So there were at least two events, maybe three, maybe more, who knows, but at least, at least two. The problem is, there's no conclusive molecular evidence for the origins of primary plastids, or it's conflicting. And the chloroplasts in the extant organisms may not reflect those in extinct ancestors at all, right? There might, there might have been too much horizontal gene transfer for us to know what that, that um, primary original ancestor was like. So, this is the problem of being able to go back in time. We can only study what's alive now. But here's what we do know. No living cyanobacterium exhibits all of the traits of the putative chloroplast ancestor. It has some of them and it shares genes with them, but it doesn't have all the traits. So whatever that original organism was, it was cyanobacterial-like, but it wasn't the cyanobacterium that's still alive today. Who has primary plastids? Well, you've kind of already seen this. The glycophytes, green algae and land plants, and the red algae. All of these creatures were the outcome of this primary event. And it's called Archaeoplast Archaeoplastida or Archaeoplastids, like original oldest plastids. This is the first event. Um, glycophytes are microscopic, tiny little aquatic or marine organisms. Rhodophyta or the red algae and chlorophyta are the green algae, and plants and mosses, which you're very familiar with. Okay, so we're almost done for today, but here is a figure that um, you are gonna see quite a bit this term, because it shows the evolution of all eukaryotes, not all of them, but a lot of the major groups of eukaryotes based on how many endosymbiotic events they had. So if you imagine you have this a very move that far. This heterotrophic, this putative heterotrophic ancestor. Maybe it came from Archaea. Who knows? We'll never know, probably. But it was just ooching around looking for food and it found a cyanobacterium like creature and it, it engulfed it, but it didn't eat it. Now, from that creature that didn't eat that of cyanobacterium, we get these three, these three lineages. Um, and then these lineages, the one that became chlorophyta, the green alga, went on to become bryophytes and land plants. Now, if we go back to that ancestor, that ooching around heterotroph, its ancestors went on to become fungi and heterotrophic protists. So from this original putative ancestor, we've already got quite a bit of radiation and we haven't even gotten down to secondary or tertiary. Um, thanks. Okay, I am going to stop there for today, I think, because I want to talk, I want to save something. Um, we've got quite a lot coming up. Yeah, uh, I'll just skip to the questions. So, some good questions for your final would be something like this. Explain how endosymbiosis evolved and who the putative ancestors are and what we know about them. What are the three types of serial endosymbiosis? Draw a diagram showing the evolution of these three types, indicating examples of each. And you couldn't do that yet because we haven't really talked about that very much, but we will be able to. And can you draw the relationship of all major taxa in this course based on an evolution of mitochondrial chloroplasts? This is what I would like you to be able to do someday, right? Is 
So draw some kind of flow chart like that showing how from a putative heterotrophic ancestor, all of this diversity happened. Okay, I have no idea how long I've been talking, but probably too much. I will see you guys Friday. Have a good week. Bye.